Hey everyone, Sebastian here from Green Music Productions. You saw the title, you saw the thumbnail, you know what time it is. It's time for my ultimate in-depth Cubase 12 review. This is really exciting. As usual, I try to give you as much information as I can on all the new features. I try to go in-depth and give you tips along the way. So if you like that kind of content, click the like button and subscribe. I have a mailing list in the description below. It's free. I'm not going to spam you guys. It's just to let you know when I release new exciting content. So check it out as well. Now let's dive right in. As you can see on the screen, there's a ton of new features. These aren't all huge features, but there's a lot of really good stuff in there. So uh, it's going to be a long video. There's a lot of things to cover, but I hope you'll enjoy this. The first feature I want to talk about is the Steinberg Activation Manager, aka no more clunky dongles needed. Now, the way it works, it's super simple. The first time you launch the application, it's going to ask you to log into your My Steinberg account and you'll see your available license. So if you bought Cubase Pro 12, you're going to see it over here and you just have to click activate. Now it's going to take a couple of seconds. It's going to sync to the server and activate it on this computer. You can activate it on up to three machines. And if you need to use it on another computer, you can always deactivate it on one of those machines and use it on another computer, then deactivate it. So you can manage your licenses like that. But I feel like three machines is really good. Uh, to be honest, I have two PCs and one laptop at home and it was a pain to always carry around my e-licensor. And now I just installed it in my laptop and I'm working in Cubase in my bed without having that clunky e-licensor. I love it. It's super simple to use. Just to let you know, the grace period to upgrade to Cubase 12 for free if you bought Cubase 11 is November 10th, 2021. So if you bought Cubase 11 after that date, you can upgrade to Cubase 12 for free. Now check it out on the Steinberg website. This is obviously something you should do if you bought it after November 10th, 2021. Now, in previous Cubase versions, we already add ARA capabilities, but these add to be applied to every single clips. So let's say I have a vocal tracks with a bunch of clips on it and I want to use Melodyne. I have Melodyne and I want to use it to tune the vocals. I add to right click, go under extensions and enable Melodyne for all of the clips. And this was really annoying. Now in Cubase 12, there's an option to easily apply it to the whole track. So it's over here in the inspector. Once you selected the track, you can just click on it, select what you want to apply. So let's say I'm going to apply spectral layers to that track. It's going to take a couple seconds and you can see the extension icon over here and on all the events on the track. So if I double click on this first clip, spectral layers opens in the lower window. I can see and edit that clip over here but if I zoom out I see everything else that is on that track so I can edit everything on the track at once this is really good uh, it saves a lot of time I use spectral layers one quite a bit and it's really useful to have that feature now now let's say you tweak some stuff in the extension and you would like to render it to be able to just double click and have the sample editor to open up instead of having the extension it's easy to do but you have multiple options now, if you drag it into an empty slot, it's just going to create a new track with the extension on that track as well. So that's not what you want in this case. However, if you drag it into an empty track that already exists, it's going to ask you if you want to bounce the extension event. So if you click yes, it's just going to bounce what was there and the extension is not there anymore. So you can double click and open the sample editor really easily. The only problem with that is if your clip had content after the edge over here, it's going to bounce it so you'll lose what was there. So there's an option for that as well. So if I revert, let's say I trim that clip a little so there's information after the end of the event. Instead of bringing it to a new track, I can simply right click on it, go under extensions and make extension permanent. So this is going to apply the extension to the clip. And now if I drag it somewhere else, I can just click no. I don't want to bounce it. And it's going to apply the process on it anyway. And I still have what was after the event. They also included the option to have a free warp in the project window. So now you can select the free warp if you click on the lower portion of 
that icon over here, you have access to free warp, or you can also control click if you're on a PC or command click if you're on a Mac, click on free warp, and now you can easily free warp at, at markers and just move them around easily right in the project window. You can also select multiple tracks, add a marker to all the tracks and manipulate them that way. And what's beautiful is if you add it over here, this track is not long enough, but it's still gonna apply it to the track that are there. So it's really useful and it allows you to quickly free warp in the project window. Now let's say you want to apply free warp on multiple uh, recordings. Let's say you recorded the drums with multiple microphones. It's really important that all the track stays in phase uh, because let's say you have a snare hit, that snare hit is gonna bleed into all the other microphones and if you just warp that snare track, it's gonna phase and sound weird in the other microphones. So they included an option for that. You have to create a new folder with all the tracks that you want to warp. So let's say I select those three track, right click, move selected tracks to a new folder. Now on the folder, as usual, you have the group editing button, but you also have a phase coherent audio warp. So if I click that, it's gonna ask me to bounce the track right now because they're not the same length. Usually if you record a full drum, everything is gonna be the same length, but for now I can just click bounce. It's gonna make them all the same length. Now the beautiful thing is if I apply uh, free warp markers, I can move them around. They're always gonna stay in phase no matter what. Another thing they included with the free warp function is the ability to select multiple events double click on one to open the sample editor and you can just use the free warp over there. It's gonna be applied to all the selected events. Now you always have the option to see a different track that you have selected if you want. Uh, you also have an option to just display the active track or all of them and to edit only the active clip or all of them. So if you select all of them, now if you go under audio warp, click on free warp, you're gonna be able to edit them all at the same time. So let's add a warp marker, move it around. As you can see, it changed all of the clips at once. A great feature that was implemented in the previous versions of Cubase is the scale assistant for the MIDI editor. It makes it really easy to select a scale or to use a chord track and to make the editor follow exactly that scale. Uh, but now they included that in Vary Audio as well. So let's say you're tuning vocals. I can just open up the vocal track over here, enable Vary Audio. And now in Vary Audio, I have the scale assistant here. I can just open it up really easily and I have the option to use either the editor scale over here or the chord track if I have a chord track in my project. Now let's just use the editor scale over here. Let's select C let's say I select C harmonic minor. You also have scale suggestions if you want, uh, but these are the two important options because now if I click this, it's gonna show me the notes that are in that scale. So the darker lanes that you see right here are not in the scale and the brighter ones are. So you can easily uh, tune the vocals to make sure it's in the scale. You also have the option to snap pitch editing. So let's say I want to tune my vocal. I know the track is in C harmonic minor. Now I can only tune it to the right notes in the scale. So it makes it really easy and fast for you to tune the vocals and make sure it's perfectly in the scale. Now, if you're like me and you don't have perfect pitch, I'm sure in the past you often try to find the chord or a scale of a track or even of a sample. Now in Cubase 12, it's super easy to do. You have three ways to do it. They're all extremely easy. I have a piano track over here and I, let's say I want to know what scale and what chords are in that track. I can simply right click to have the contextual menu appear. If you don't see the contextual menu, it means that you have an option in the preference enabled you can just go under editing tools and disable the show toolbox on right click. What it's gonna do is that instead of showing the toolbox when you right click, it's gonna show you the contextual menu. It is really powerful because you have all the important information right here, depending on the type of event you click on. Now, 
back to what I was saying, uh, you can just select the create chord events. Now let's try it out. It automatically created a chord track and it detected the chords and the scale of that track. It was blazingly fast. So let's listen to it and see if it did a great job. That's perfect. Just like that, I know exactly the chords and the scale. So if you're trying to cover a song, it's so easy to do now. Or if you just have a reference track, you would like to know the chords, super easy to do. And if you combine that to the option that was already there that detect the tempo of a track, it's super easy to detect the tempo really quickly, the chords and the scale. So you're all set. Now, there are two other ways to do that. Let's say you already have a chord track in your project. You can easily just drag and drop any event on the chord track. Keep in mind that if you move left or right, it's only going to appear right where the clip was originally. So you can't just drag that here and it's going to show over here. That's not how it works. Um, but it's that easy. If you already have a chord track, just drag and drop a file to it and it will analyze the scale and the chords. Now, the third way to do that is to select the event, go under project, chord track and create chord event. So that way, just like if you right click and use the context menu to select that option, it's going to create a chord track for you and put all the good information on the chord track itself. Now, in previous Cubase versions, we already had an option to import tracks from project. Now, in Cubase 12, they expanded that feature and made it even more powerful. So in this project right here, I also have uh, some signature and tempo track. It's now super easy to also import tempo and signature track just like that. They also included a feature that was already in Nuendo, but it's now in Cubase Pro 12, and it's the ability to export clips or even range selection. Usually when you want to export something, you have to open the export audio mix down panel and it's tedious, uh, it's quite complicated, uh, but if you just want to quickly export the selected events, it's now super easy to do. You just select them, go under file, export, and you have the option selected events or selected tracks. Now I assigned a keyboard shortcut to those. Uh, it's always useful to assign keyboard shortcuts to the features you use the most. Just as a reminder to edit the keyboard shortcuts, you go under edit, key commands, and you can tweak all the keyboard shortcuts over there. Now let's say I want to export those clips I selected. I just click on selected events and I have a bunch of options over here I can select as separate events, as block events, as one event. Uh, that only affects the horizontal uh, events on the track. It doesn't mean if you say one event, it doesn't mean that it's gonna make one event out of the two tracks. It's just, if there's multiple clips on that track, it's gonna make it one big event. Now you also have the option to export it dry, include the channel settings, including panning, volume, and inserts. The complete signal path so if it's routed to a group and you have effects on it, it's gonna include them as well, or the complete signal path with the master effects. So if you have, let's say, a limiter on the master channel, it's gonna take that into effect. Now you also have the option to include a tail. So if you have a reverb and you want to include that reverb, so it's not the exact length of the clip selected, you can add tail in seconds or bars in beat. So if I select seconds, I can add a two seconds tail to let time for the reverb just fade out. Now you can also use the uh, naming scheme. So if you export multiple clips that way, you can make sure that they're named properly depending on what you need. Always useful. And once you're done, you just have to click export and it's blazingly fast. It reminds me of a uh, Reaper. One thing that I really liked in Reaper uh, is that when you export audio clips, it's super fast. It's one thing that they changed in Cubase 12. They made the export way faster they optimize the routing and usually when you export files, they reroute a bunch of stuff in the back end that you don't see to make sure that the export is good. Uh, now it's way faster to export clips. Uh, but for that feature specifically, you can also export a range selection. So let's say I just select this range over here and I want to export it. 
I'm going to use my keyboard shortcut, which is Alt R. You won't have that keyboard shortcut. You have to make sure you assign it as I told you earlier, but now I can just export that selection as well. So let's try to do that. Let's select this export, create unique names. Just like that, it exported exactly the range that I selected. This is really useful. I will use that quite a bit. Now, as I told you, they tweaked a bunch of stuff under the hood to make Cubase more performant. And they did the same thing for zooming. If you have big sessions with a lot of events, it's now way snappier to just zoom in and out. So they tweaked a bunch of little things to improve the performance of Cubase. I think they're listening to what the people are saying regarding the performance and it's paying off. So uh, this is another real cool thing in Cubase 12. It's snappier, it exports faster, and it's way easier now to just zoom in and out when you have huge sessions. Now, I saw a lot of users request this feature on the Cubase forum and it's the ability to either render in place or export audio while taking into consideration a sidechain compression or uh, any sidechain effects. Uh, because if you're exporting a stems from your songs uh, to a mixer, for example, you want him to import those stems and it will sound exactly like it sounded in your session. Well, in older versions of Cubase, it didn't apply the sidechain when exporting stems. So let me just demonstrate how it works now. So let's say for the sake of making it simpler, I'm just going to create a group track um, with those two tracks in. So I'm just going to open the mix console, create a new group channel with those two tracks. And I'm going to load a compressor on that group channel and I'll enable the sidechain. So usually to do what I'm talking about, you would have to click on activate sidechain on the plugin that you want to be triggered by sidechain. And you would have to select what track you want to trigger the sidechain on that plugin. So in that case, I'll just select audio two, which is a drum track. So let's do that. So now every time that the drum hits, it's going to compress everything that is going into the group. So those two tracks right here. So let's listen to it. So as you can see, the piano get compressed quite a bit when this drum right here is playing. This is what Sidechain does. It basically triggers a specific plugins on another channel from another track. In this case, I'm ducking the piano every time a drum hits. So usually in previous versions of Cubase, if I, for example, render this track or export the stem from this track, it wouldn't apply the side chain to it. But now let's just render this track in place and you'll see what it does. I'm going to include the complete signal path to make sure that the side chain is taking into effect. I'll click render. And now, as you can see, when the drum is playing, it pumped or docked the piano track. And when it finished, it went back to its original volume. So it's really useful to have that option. If you don't want to include the sidechain effect in your export or renders, you can just disable the sidechain and it's not going to apply it. Another small thing that they changed, it's just a visual change. But as you can see now, some UI elements are more uniform. They look like everything else. Now they edited Vary Audio in the past, but now the hit points also look just like the rest. It looks snappy and pretty clean in my opinion. It's way more uniform that way. One Cubase feature that is often overlooked is the Project Logical Editor. So if you go under Project and you select the Project Logical Editor, you'll see that in Cubase 12, it changed quite a bit. It had a facelift. You now have a preset pop up right here. So just like everything else, you can search your presets and you can easily do a bunch of actions in the factory presets. You can also create your own user presets, um, but they also added a bunch of options in the project logical editor. First in the targets section, if you select property and you select set or not set, you also have the option to select parent object is selected. So that's useful, let's say, if you have tracks in a folder 
and you want to only apply it if the parent object is selected, that in that case, the folder, it will apply to it. Another thing they added in the target filter is if you go under position, we now have the option inside selected marker. So let's say you have range marker, uh, you can select a marker and with that option, it's going to apply only to what's in that marker. Still in the position uh, filter target, we now have outside bar range, so you can select a range. So let's say you want to select a specific file outside a bar range, you can specify that range. Now in the event transform action, in the trim target, we now have the option to increment volume in dB, decrement volume in dB, so you can easily increase or decrease the volume in dB with the trim action target. Also in the set color option in the transform actions, we now have increment and decrement. So let's say you have a color palette with a bunch of colors in it. You can use that to make the colors increment or decrement depending on what you select. There's also new options in the name action target. Now it's really easy to erase some characters before a specific word after uh, the front character or the end character. So let's say, for example, I have base acid 01. Let's say I just want to keep base. I have a bunch of base files. I just want to keep the base uh, in the name. So I can do erase after in the parameter. I just enter base. And let's say here I can just select the container type, track, apply. Just like that, it removed everything that was after base. Now you can do also before, so if you want to remove stuff before uh, base, for example, or you can just erase front or end character. So if I select this, as you can see, it's deleting all the last characters of every single words in the tracks. So these are useful if you use a macro and you select a bunch of things that you want it to do automatically. The project logical editor is super useful because you can implement those functions into your macros if you want. And you also have a new option over here. It's the deselect. So usually we had the select that we use quite a bit. Uh, me personally, uh, in specific actions, I would like to select specific events or tracks. Now we also have deselect. So just to give you an example, if I select base, I click apply, it just deselected it. So really useful if you want to use it again in a macro. Another amazing feature in Cubase 12 is there's now an option to map pretty much any Cubase function to any knob, faders, or buttons on your MIDI controller. Now, the old way to do it would be, let's say you want to apply some quick controls to a fader on your MIDI controller. You would have to go under Studio, Studio Settings, and create a MIDI device and try to map it. It was painful. Uh, as you can see now, we have MIDI remote and it looks way better. Um, depending on the keyboard that you have, a bunch of keyboard company already made some script that will work directly out of the box for Cubase 12. Like Arturia, in my case, they made scripts for pretty much all of their MIDI controller. I know Chord did a bunch as well. So if your keyboard is not included in Cubase 12, it will be soon. But it's not a big deal because you can create a custom one yourself. So the way it works, let me just open the lower zone over here. And now I have a tab called MIDI Remote. If you don't see it, you can click the gear icon and make sure you have MIDI Remote. So if I click this, I can see the exact layout of my keyboard. And if I move faders, I can see the faders move. I can see everything that is happening on my keyboard. This is really amazing. I didn't have to do anything because the script was already included. So I can see here that the MIDI controller is the right one. I have options for the different key lab, but mine is the 88 note. And there's even mapping. So you can map different functions depending on if you're in the mixer, on selected tracks, on EQs of selected tracks. You can apply different mappings if you want. Now, to know the exact list of script that are included right now, if you click that gear button right here, it's gonna open a new window. This is the MIDI remote manager. Now I can see that my key lab essential is listed over here, but if I want to see all the scripts that companies made, you can just click on the scripts 
tab over here and you can see all the scripts that other companies made. So you can see that Akai, Korg, a bunch of companies made the scripts for their keyboard over here. So let's say your keyboard is not supported. It's super easy to create a new one. I'll show it to you a bit later, but for now, let me just show you how easy it is now to map any buttons to any features. So let's say I want to map uh, just for fun, uh, this fader over here to the record button on the piano track. I can right click on the button, select pick for MIDI remote mapping. And right here, it automatically selected the record enable on the piano track. It's waiting for me to move a button on my MIDI controller. So I'll move the fader and I just have to click apply mapping done just like that. So uh, you can either right click on stuff and apply them to buttons over here, or you can also click that little button over here to show the different functions that can be mapped. So you have mouse pointers, control room functions, mix consoles, transport, selected tracks. You have a bunch of stuff and you can easily select them. Let's say I want to, to match QC2 to the second fader. I move the second fader, apply, and it's mapped. So now if I move the second fader, it's going to tweak QC2 on the focus quick control. So it's really powerful, but really easy to use. Now, let's say your MIDI controller doesn't have a script yet in Cubase 12. It might have one in the future because all the companies are making scripts for their MIDI controller to work in Cubase 12 easily. But it's no big deal if you don't have one because you can create a mapping yourself if you want to have a representation of your keyboard. Uh, it's not that complicated, but since I have a supported one, I won't do it all, but you just click the plus button still in the MIDI remote tab in the lower zone. You select the MIDI input and output ports. You give it a name. In this case, I could call it Key Lab uh, Test. I'm the creator. You click next, and then you can uh, add some knobs, some faders, some buttons. You add a knob, you just twist a knob, it's going to detect it and you can put it anywhere you want on the layout. You can change the grid size. So you will just have a representation of your keyboard visually there. So it's going to be easier for you to map new stuff to it in the future. Another small thing that they tweak is the volume automation are now not relying on buffer size anymore because it used to be the case so the volume automation were not really precise depending on your buffer size. If you had a big buffer size, then it was really not that precise. But now it's almost sample accurate. So any volume automation that you do will be way more accurate now. Uh, it's always good to have in Cubase. It's now just snappier and more precise. Another thing they added, another small tweak, but you can have key commands now to nudge part selected parts uh, all events of one frame, higher or lower if you want. So it's really easy. It's something nice if you're working on movies or trailers or anything with videos because you can really snap to the frames and just nudge it really easily with the keyboard shortcuts. So the options are here in the key command manager. So make sure to check it out if you like that kind of stuff. Another feature they added is a modifier to trim an event while keeping the fade end intact. So what am I saying right now? So let's say you have a fade in like this and you want to trim the beginning of the event. Usually the fade would stay the same. However, if I hold that uh, keyboard modifier, now I can just trim it and the fade will stay the same. So that's good if let's say you have a hit and you want the fade in to lead into that hit. You don't want to move, but you want to trim because it's way too long. You can easily do that now by holding that modifier. Now to change the modifiers, you have to go under edit, preferences, and over here you have two modifiers. You go under size object and you have an option to size with fade. You can assign it to any modifiers you want. We now also have more options for fades with the range selection tool. So let's say I select the beginning of this event, I right click and I go under fades. We now have more options. So let's say I want the fade out uh, from the range end. I have an option to do that. It's going to do a huge fade out after the range. 
there's a bunch of little tweaks like that that will make your life easier if you like that kind of stuff. So you can always apply the standard fade in and fade out, but you can also do fade in from range, uh, fade out from the end of range, a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, small addition, but always nice to have. I don't know if you ever use the slip editing uh, modifier, but it's really useful uh, if you have something after the uh, trim range of an event. If you hold that modifier, you can just always slip what's inside the event and move it around. There was no keyboard shortcut for that in the past, but now there are some keyboard shortcut for that. If you go under key command again, you search for slip. You can see slip event content left or right, so you can assign any keyboard shortcut to do that. They also added another keyboard shortcut called move event ends to cursor. We already had the move event start to cursor. I use that quite a lot, but now you can assign a keyboard shortcut and it will move the selected event. It will snap the end of the event you selected to the cursor. So that's always good. Now, if you ever use Nuendo, you know that they have an advanced crossfade editor, but now it's part of Cubase Pro 12 as well. So let's do a crossfade over here and open the editor. As you can see, it's way more advanced. There's a lot more options. You can easily tweak the fade in and fade out of the different files, the range and everything that you want. Um, but you also have pre-roll, post-roll. You can just listen to the fade out, the fade in, or play the whole crossfade. You can tweak them both separately. You can nudge them really easily. So there's a lot of options over here that you can tweak. Um, if you don't like that in the preferences, there's an option. You can still use the simple crossfade editor, but if you get used to the advanced crossfade editor, it makes your life easier. Now here we can see that I have a track with a really long name, uh, usually in Cubase 11. I have a, a screenshot here of what it looked like in the mix console in Cubase 11. So the name was just cut out. You could just only see a small portion of the name in the mix console. Now, if we take a look at what it looks like in Cubase 12, it does a proper wrapping of the text. It only wraps uh, two lines, so if it's way longer than this, it's going to truncate a part of the name. But it's way better than what it used to be because you can see way more. Now, in older versions of Cubase, we used to have different zooms for the event editor, depending on, let's say, I open this file over here and I have a specific zoom for it. If I open another track and I reopen this one, it's going to keep the same zoom. Well, now it's an option that you can select over here in the sample editor. You have a global zoom, so the zoom will be the same no matter where you are in any tracks that you are. You also have the option to have a clip-based zoom, so it will remember the exact zoom of each clip. So if I zoom in really intensively on this track, if I go back, it's going to keep the same zoom. Or you have auto zoom to event. This is only going to give you the full length of the event you selected right away. Now, if we go under studio and select the audio performance window or press F12, we can now see that there's a lot more information in there. We have the real time load. This one is pretty good. We have the ASIO guard load. The peak load, so if you have latency problems like I have right now, this one will move around quite a bit. And we also have the disk cache. So we have way more options to figure out what's wrong in our project. Keep in mind that if you have the performance meter over here, it's still the sample version with only two lines. So the uh, maximum load and the disk cache load. They also improved the video engine, but this is mostly affecting people on Mac. So I know some people had issues with videos on Mac in the past. Well, I didn't test it, but they improved the video engine for people on Mac, so make sure to check it out. While we're on the topic, uh, they also support Apple Silicon now, so all the new Apple computers are supported in Cubase 12 as we expected. I don't know if you noticed, but they also changed the way the waveforms are drawn. So let's say I make it bigger. So it's a lot smoother now. As you can see, it becomes a line and everything is just smoother. Uh, the same when it's selected, everything is just smoother. So it's easier on your eye, it's more precise. We like it. 
Now in Cubase 12, when using the Mix Convert V6 plugin to downmix 5.1 to let's say stereo, in this case I'm using stereo so I can't really showcase it to you, but you can now activate the option to create an LTRT type output signal. So in the resulting stereo signal, the surround channels are matrix encoded to the left right channels according to Dolby Pro Logic spec. So if you work in post production, that's a useful feature for you. Speaking of multi channel, Cubase now support Dolby Atmos. So it's not as powerful as Nuendo yet, but you have more configuration. You can now do more than 7.1. You can do Dolby Atmos and you have a bunch of configuration that were only previously in Nuendo. So that's really good. There are some limitation to what you can do in the Dolby Atmos renderer in Cubase, but it's amazing that they included it. You can take a look at the manual to find out what the limitations are. Most of the case, if you're using music in Atmos, you're not going to be very limited. Cubase 12 now supports WinRT MIDI, so MIDI over Bluetooth if you need. That's really cool if you have Bluetooth on your computer and you have a device that supports Bluetooth MIDI. You can activate it if you go in the studio setup by clicking on studio, studio setup and you go under the MIDI port setup, you have the option to activate WinRT MIDI if you want. They also added some new modules for the Supervision plugin. I really like uh, that plugin because it really helps you see exactly what you want. The first thing they added is a VU meter, so you can, just like on an old vintage console, you can have a VU meter right there, and you can always resize it uh, and put it wherever you want. So that's really neat. They also added a spectrum keyboard. So if I play something, you can see moving according to the notes on the keyboard. Another thing they added is a phase balance module. So you can easily see your phase. It's a really nice addition. They also added a level histogram. So it's nice to see the level over time, but the thing that I'm most excited about is the loudness histogram. So you can see the loudness over time. Now let's take a look at the exciting new plugins included in Cubase 12. The first one, I really like what it does. It's a creative plugin. You can get crazy with it or you can use it just to dock uh, some signal, um, to do some sidechain if you want and it's called the FX modulator. It is a multi-effect with modulation capabilities. So you have a bunch of curves right here in the factory bank, but you can also draw your own curves and add them into three other user banks. You can save and load different banks as well. So at first we need to load an FX. So let's, let's load a chorus, for example. So you can add up to one, two, three, four, five, six effects in a row. And you can modulate different parameters of different effects at the same time. So let's listen to this piano track. So let's say I want the mix to be at 100 or maybe, maybe 50% just to start. And I want to draw a frequency curve. So let me just add a dot here make it simple for now, uh, make it uniform. So just like that, right now it's applying a little bit of course, but it's ramping up and going back down. Now, if I don't like that timing, I can make it phase sync, I can snap it to beat so I can raise it up. Let's say I want it to go faster. really slow. Really cool what you can do. Now let's add another effect. Let's add some width. And with this one, I'll use an existing curve just like this. It's weird what it's doing because it's applying chorus and it's expanding the width according to uh, that curve at the same time. Now let's add something a bit more intense, like let's say an overdrive. Let's do a step up. 
And obviously you can change the different settings, uh, not only the timing, but I can make it smoother. So it's, it's, it looks more like a curve than steps. Um, I can change the mix for each and every uh, single effects. So that's really cool. And I can do a bunch of things to the curve if I want. You have undo and redo, but you can also shift the curve to the right, to the left. You can flip vertically, flip horizontally. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do. You can select all the dots at the same time and move them around if you want as well. And you have a random curve button right here. That's always nice. So let's add a module. Uh, let's add, let's say, a frequency shifter. I'm going to remove the overdrive for now or just bypass it for now. So for frequency shifter, I can have a curve for shift. So let's do something simple and also for feedback. So for feedback, let's say I want the curve to be different. Let's bypass everything except this one. I love what it can do. Uh, you have a bunch of effects. You have coarse, filter, width, bit crusher, pitch shifter, compressor, time shifter, flanger, multi-mod, pan, overdrive, frequency shifter, volume, and reverb. So the volume can easily be used with this setting to dock. Uh, let's say there's a kick drum again, and you want to dock the bass, uh, the synth bass, uh, every time the kick hits, and it's a four on the floor, you can just apply that. Or you can use the trigger module and enable the side chain over here or the MIDI. So you can say uh, that this curve will trigger every time there's a threshold reach in the side chain. And same thing for MIDI. So it is really useful what you can do with this. It's super powerful because you can modulate pretty much uh, every effects, but you can uh, decide when you want to trigger the curve draw your own curve. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. Let's add just for fun. The frequency shifter is really interesting. So let's add um, a pitch shifter on top of it and do a random curve. That is really fun. You have a bunch of presets. Um, if you want to do risers, uh, a lot of interesting things. I love plugins like that. A shimmer. The time shifter does something really interesting. It's kind of like a looper, but... Uh... That's really fun. So I could just listen to a, the presets all day. Uh, there's a lot of presets, so you can get really creative. So if you're into sound design or doing crazy, crazy effects in your production, you'll be more than happy with this plugin. So now let's move on to the next plugin. And the next plugin is one that is always good to have on your master track and it's called Razor. It's basically a super fast limiter. So for mastering, it is really good for limiting any peaks that you don't want. It is really fast, really nice to have. You can crank it up a bunch. So if you're looking to have that extreme loudness, this is a really good plugin to have. Now, they also changed the layout of the step filter. The functionalities are the same, but they wanted to make it more uniform with the rest of the plugins. So it looks way nicer now. It's same functionalities. It still sounds great, but it looks way better. They also added the Lindither plugin. You can just put it on your master. If you're going from, let's say, 24 bits to 16 bit while mastering for CD, you just put it on your output and it works really well. Now let's open Alliance Sonic SE and look at what they added. They added this library right here called Verve. It is a really good piano library. 
So let me just put in a version of Halion on one of those track. And over here, we obviously see everything that we have. But if I click in the preset browser, I can go and select Verve only. And let's listen to what it sounds like. Beautiful sounding piano. And you have a bunch of presets. Uh, it layers pianos with synths, so let's try this one. Let's try dramatic. Pretty cool. Nice. We have a bunch of presets. Uh, this sample sounds really good. So if you need a piano VSTi, it now comes free with Cubase in Halion Sonic SE. So before we end this video, I just wanted to show you because I get asked those questions quite a lot. What features are included in Cubase Pro Artist or Elements? So here you have the list of new features and if they're included in Elements Artist or Pro. So uh, uh, you can pause this screen if you want to look at it a bit longer. Uh, I also want to show you the different limitations of the different versions. So over here, you can see the different limitations uh, of Cubase Pro, Artist and Elements. So a lot of people are asking me, is it worth upgrading or is this feature in Cubase Elements or Artist? Now pause this uh, video right here and take a look at those limitations. You'll have all the information that you need. So there was a lot of stuff to cover, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, as usual, if you like that kind of stuff, please click the like button, subscribe, and please let me know in the comments below uh, if you're happy with this version or what are your favorite new features. Uh, for me personally, I think there's a lot of really good features a lot of small tweaks as well that will make your life easier. So overall, it's a pretty good update. They skipped the 0.5, they went from 11 to 12. Let me know what you think and what are your favorite features in the comments below. And as usual, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.